Good morning. Glad you could join us again as always. We're thankful that you're here and uh, I'm going to invite you to open this morning to an encouraging passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 13 through 18 and then I want to dive into a topic revolving around the idea of prophecy eschatology and in particular uh, the rapture of the church. And so let's go ahead and dive into that passage. It's uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 is where we're going to start. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have, who have no hope. Now, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. But the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the tr- sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Um, Now, the idea of the rapture that is spoken of here in the church, the idea that the Lord will come and pull us out of this world, uh, ultimately um, um, meeting him in the air, That definition, that description, I should say, of us meeting him in the air, by definition, means we're talking about a different event than when Jesus returns in the second coming. In the second coming, he returns to the earth. He sets foot down on the Mount of Olives. Uh, The mountain splits. We see him establish his kingdom. There uh, There is this global resistance against him. All of those who are under the sway of the Antichrist will come against him ultimately in that time. But he's on the earth in that second coming, establishing his millennial kingdom. Um, The rapture is a different event. The rapture is an event where he snatches away his bride, the church, from the earth, believers, from the earth to meet him in the air to go be with him in heaven until he then returns later for the second coming. And this this idea that, that he will bring those with him, that refers to believers that he first snatched away, we see the same thing in the book of Jude, where he comes with ten thousands of his saints, uh, and that's uh, again indicative of in the second coming. He's coming with those who ultimately are with him in heaven uh, during that time, where ultimately judgment is coming upon the earth. Now I'm going a little bit quickly through that, <clears throat> and, and assuming a few things. If you're not sure what uh, how some of that plays out, um, I, I did a series of podcasts that were sort of a <clears throat> kind of like a prophecy 101 almost kind of a thing, a series of podcasts where we talked about some of these things. And you can find that uh, both on our YouTube channel with Calvary Chapel Franklin and then also on my personal uh, website, parsonspad.com. You can look up those podcasts and watch those. And um, But the idea of the rapture is a snatching away of the bride of Christ, where the, the, the bridegroom comes for his bride, takes her out, and brings her home, and then later will ultimately bring judgment. Now, this is an important thing, not only for us to understand now, but to understand from the context in which it was written. Um, uh, From the opening verses there in verse 13 that we read, um, Paul was clearly speaking to a question that they had in their minds that was troubling them. And if you read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, uh, we, we can gather from this that they thought that they might be entering into or might be in the midst of Uh, the day of the Lord because of the persecution that they were experiencing. Um, And so Paul was, uh, that's one question. Then the other question is, what about those who have died prior to this time? I mean, Jesus is about to come. The day of the Lord has come, and yet some have died, which to me speaks to the idea that they were expecting the Lord to come for them at any time. Um, Typically, the idea of of some of the things we're talking about, the rapture and, 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 uh, uh, and that kind of a thing are, are sometimes uh, attributed to 18th century thinking much later than these events. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that's the case. Uh, my reading of scripture would, would lead me to think that, that they were expecting the Lord to return for them even then. And the fact that Paul took time to explain these ideas to them, at one point he says, you remember how I told you about these things when I was with you. When, uh, when Paul had planted this church and had spent just really three short weeks with them, three Sabbaths, as we read in the book of Acts, we see Paul there. Uh, In that time, he not only um, helped to establish the church 
um, you know, in terms of a body, but theologically, doctrinally, he got into some heavy things, including things like the second coming, the rapture, uh, the last things, uh, the Antichrist, and stuff like that. Uh, and from that, I would, I would suggest that um, not only should we in churches teach these things, but we should not be afraid to teach them even to young believers, uh, people who are new in their faith, to help them understand uh, ultimately uh, a lot of things about you know, the, the, uh, how the end times will play out and ultimately to encourage them to look forward to these things in the midst of what's going on in the world around us today, just like they did then. Um, but so the rapture is a separate thing from the second coming, and the rapture comes prior to the second coming. Now, the question of when the rapture comes is another thing entirely, and there are people that have lots of different views on that. More on that in a minute. But first, I just want to touch on, or continue on a thought here that, uh, um, that, that I just began to raise. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, recently asked uh, about the idea of eschatology. Why spend so much time on it? Um, it, does, it does it make us better Christians to spend more time on this? And that's a fair question. And here's why I think that's a very fair question. Because there, there, are, there are some in the body of Christ uh, with whom you would assume that eschatology is the one thing that matters in, in, in theology. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's like this is the only thing that we ever talk about. And we got to be a little bit, uh, first off, we have to acknowledge that. that. That is true. There are some people that are so fixated on this very question, uh, the coming of, of Christ in the rapture, when will it happen, and things like this. Um, there, th obviously, that is just one facet of our overall Christian faith. I would suggest that it's an important one, but, um, but the, the fact that we talk about it so much should be an encouraging thing and not a divisive thing. But that we talk about, it should be something that is a part of our regular balanced diet as believers. Uh, why should we talk about these things? Well, I think for one thing, because the scriptures talk about it, because God has given it to us in the word of God. Um, prophecy as a whole topic covers about a third of the Bible. Not all of it's eschatological, not all of it has to do with last things, uh, a lot of it has to do with the first coming of Christ, you know, before you even get to the second coming of Christ. Uh, there's a lot of specific prop prophecies that just have to do with things happening at those times uh, that, are, that, you know, that, that have to do with Israel, maybe specifically during the Old Testament period or something like that. Prophecy as a, as a general topic uh, is about 30% of the scripture. And uh, eschatology is not all of that, but eschatology as a part of that is also something that we see in the scripture, not in a small way, but in a, in a pretty notable way. And I say that to say this, and this was part of my answer to the question uh, when it was asked, is that, you know, to, to sort of, um, to, to, not, to choose not to spend time in something that whether it's the topic as a whole, 30% of the Bible, or whether it's even, I don't even know what the percentage is, but let's just say 10% or 8% or of the Bible is eschatological. I, I don't know what the actual percent is. But if we just choose not to study those things, then we're choosing not to study some part of the scripture that God gave us. And I think that that just on, on the face of it is a mistake and is a costly one for us in a number of ways. Uh, we don't study eschatology um, believe it or not, only to understand end times. But understanding eschatology, at least as best as we can, helps us understand lots of other things in Scripture. We learn more about God's faithfulness when we understand that he keeps his promises, not just immediately, but even eschatologically. Um, when, when we read Romans 9 through 11, for example, there's always debate about, well, is he talking about Israel? Is he talking about sovereignty? All these kinds of things. Well, from a prophetic standpoint, um, God's faithfulness to Israel is spoken of clearly throughout Romans 9 through 11. Now, of course, God's sovereignty is also spoken of in those chapters. I don't think it has to be either or. I think that's an unnecessary dichotomy. I think that both come to the fore in those passages. Well, when we learn about the fact that God has said things to Israel and will fulfill them to Israel, by definition, that's prophetic if he fulfills those things later, well, that not only tells us something about prophecy, but it tells us something about the character of God, that he is faithful. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> if you understand those chapters properly, 
there comes a point where Paul mentions that if God doesn't keep his promises to Israel, you should be a little concerned about whether he's going to be faithful to you. But the fact is he is going to be faithful and you can base this, uh, your, your, your trust in his faithfulness to you on his faithfulness to them. And so, uh, so we learn things not just about prophecy per se, but we also learn things about the very nature and character of God. And I would suggest that as we study the, 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 the field of prophecy, the, the topic of prophecy, and even eschatology specifically, we learn additional things about the nature and character of God. We connect dots all over scripture by learning about these things as well. Um, for example, there's an entire body of, of people within the body of Christ that reject Israel's right to exist as a, as a, as a, as, as a people. They, they believe that they forfeited all their promises when they uh, handed over Jesus to be crucified. I would completely flat out reject that. And I think that you have a wild misunderstanding of a lot of scripture when you start applying things that are for Israel to the church. Is there in fact a body now where Jew and Gentile comes together? Yes, we call that the church. Then what of Israel? Well, if we understand Paul's writings uh, in, 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 in various places, then we know that Israel is on hold for the moment until the rapture of the church, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And once the church is filled, we're raptured away, and God once again works through Israel in the last days. Again, I would recommend you to the previous podcast where we talked about these things. But, um, but just to keep it on point, we learn a lot about the nature and character of God. We learn a lot about his overall purposes and plans when we study the field of prophecy and when we even look specifically into this area of eschatology or last things. And the rapture, of course, is one of the central pivotal things in that discussion. Um, so that, that kind of leads me to my, my second point. Um, we study prophecy not to be divisive about it. We don't study prophecy in order to divide the body of Christ, but rather, as, as I'll talk more about in a moment, to encourage the body of Christ. Uh, this topic can become something that becomes really argumentative, heavily debated, and not in a good way, uh, and it becomes divisive. Um, there are a number of views about the rapture and how eschatology plays out, how last things work out. And, um, and, and, and the major theories on, on that, the major views on that, are not without some merit. You know, if you, uh, if you hold a, I happen to hold a pre-tribulational uh, rapture view. I happen to think that before the 70th week of Daniel, again, a technical term that you can go back and watch some of the previous podcasts, but I believe that before that happens, the church is raptured away. Um, there are those that hold different views. There are some that hold a view that the church goes up until the middle point where the Antichrist is actually revealed and breaks the peace treaty with Israel. There are those that have a little bit more nuanced view of that area and they hold a pre-wrath view. Uh, and and that's, not, that's not specifically a mid-trib view that has other nuances to it. Uh, people like Marv Rosenthal have written on this. Um, then there are those that hold a, a, an amillennial view, which is a different view entirely from that. And so uh, each of these views has some merit to it. In my view and in my reading of scripture, I happen to think that the pre-tribulational rapture view has the, the, the most support for it scripturally, uh, uh, both uh, um, explicitly and even implicitly. I think you can point to passages like this. I think you can point to other passages that speak to this idea. I think that those are explicit kinds of passages. I think there are implicit kinds of passages. I think that when we move from Revelation 3 to Revelation 4 and John hears a voice come up here, there may be, there may be a, a, a metaphor for the rapture in that or maybe a type of the rapture. Uh, when you think about those um, uh, around the time of the flood, you have those who were uh, destroyed in the flood, you have those who were preserved through the flood, and then you have somebody who was taken out of the world before the flood. Uh, in Enoch, seventh from Adam. Uh, you have those Israel, uh, maybe represented through Noah and his family, preserved through the flood. And then of course you have the world, the unbelieving world that perishes in the flood. Well, you, uh, that, that may be a type of the rapture uh, in view there. Uh, so there are, there are reasons why I hold the view I do. Some again are very explicit scripturally, some are implicit uh, metaphorically in scripture. But other views on the rapture also have merit as well. And so even though I hold this perspective and that influences, that's my bias when I read these passages, I think the bias is founded. But everyone who holds the views on the, others, uh, the other views would have the same 
would say the same thing. And so that being said, we have to respect the fact that since it hasn't happened yet, we have to be open to the possibility that, that, that our particular view might be wrong. Okay, we look at the scriptures, we look at what's going on around us, we, 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 we view what's going on around us through the grid of the scriptures, and then we, we, we land on a camp and we say, this is kind of what I think this is, this is pointing to. But until it happens, we're sort of still in that gray area, we're not sure. And so um, that's why we don't fight about it. That's why this is one of those non-essential uh, uh, views within Christianity. You don't have to have a particular eschatological view to be a believer. I would suggest that it's hard to be a believer and not believe in a second coming and not believe that there's going to be a kingdom established by Christ and that all of that is going to come to pass. But as far as some of the events that lead up to it, there's room to differ within the body. And I think we need to respect that and not argue about it so much as have healthy discussion. Uh, here's a book that I happen to like that I'll recommend. It's called The Rapture, Pre-Tribulation, Pre-Wrath, or Post-Tribulation. Uh, it's three different views on the rapture. And you can pick this book up on Amazon or at, uh, I would love to say you can pick it up at Christian bookstores. Probably not, but you can definitely find it online. So I actually have an old copy and a newer copy. But, um, but this is a, a, a book that helps kind of explain these different views, just three of them. And there are other more nuanced views again uh, in, that people hold or people just have different ideas. But there's, there's room for us to discuss it and that's what we should do. We should discuss and even debate, but we shouldn't divide. And that's an important thing for us on this topic. But instead, we should see this as a means of encouragement. And that's the last thing I'd like to kind of jump into today. And this really becomes the focal point of the passage. It's instructive in helping us understand how things will play out and what things will come first. And of course, I would recommend reading chapters four and five, and then second Thessalonians chapter two to get the well-rounded view of what Paul taught the Thessalonians on the subject. Um, but these things are instructive for us to understand but they're intended to ultimately encourage us as well. Um, when Paul was speaking to the specific questions that they had, guys, don't worry about those who have passed before us because ultimately when Jesus comes to snatch us away, those who died before us, before that event happens, they will actually uh, be snatched away first. And Paul talks about what that looks like in 1 Corinthians 15, where we get our glorified bodies in that moment, uh, where we, we are snatched up, we receive our glorified bodies. Those who have died prior ultimately come before us, but this all happens in the twinkling of an eye, as he says there. Um, and, and, and so these things happen so fast, but in terms of explaining it and understanding it, Paul claims by word of the Lord, this is how it's gonna be. And he says, look, don't worry about it. Don't fret it. Don't think you're in the day of the Lord because that can't happen until this happens. And therefore, since you know that you're gonna see your loved ones again, since you know they're gonna be part of this when it happens, and since you're not in the last day, the, the, the day of the Lord right now, encourage one another with these things. Uh, as a matter of fact, he would go on later to talk about how, as an example of the fact that they're not in the, in the day of the Lord, is that he says that the day of the Lord is about wrath on the earth. You and I aren't appointed to that. God hasn't destined us to wrath. Again, encourage one another, as I know you're also doing. And so the idea of, of eschatology or last things or, or looking forward to both not only the second coming, but even the rapture prior should bring us an incredible amount of, of encouragement. We should look to these things as things that bolster our faith and help us to understand the days in which we live, to recognize that today is an important day for us to live out our faith so that others might come and be part of this as well. Um, that's an important thing for us to recognize and to understand, not to divide over, but to encourage one another over. And so it's good for us, and let me encourage you, to spend time studying the area of prophecy in general, understand what it's about, understand things about the prophecies of Christ's first coming and, and how that, uh, how that uh, is given to us so that when he came, you, he'd have all of this uh, preemptive prophecy talking about him coming. And so we understand that he fulfilled those things. And then take some time and also understand that same thing when it comes to his second coming and even the rapture prior and allow those things to encourage you in your faith. Are there things that we can't understand yet? Sure, yeah, there are. But at the same time, God has given us these things in his word. And while they do have an immediate context, no doubt, 
they are clearly given to those uh, of us today as we move ever closer to the events finally unfolding. And we should be as encouraged as they were in the first century. So that being said, um, it's, it's, it's possible that lots of questions may come up out of that. On the one hand, I would encourage you again to go and, and watch some of the previous podcasts we've done on the subject of prophecy. Um, and then uh, we did a second series of podcasts, uh, Is This the Beginning of the End?, where we kind of talked about some of the events going on in the world around us uh, in the light of biblical prophecy. If you have questions even beyond those things, you can always reach out again on our YouTube page through the comments. Uh, you can reach our YouTube page if, if, uh, well, if, if you're watching this on a different outlet. Our YouTube page can be connected through our website at calvarychapelfranklin.com. Uh, or if you're watching here and you want to go to my personal uh, blog, my website, it's parsonspad.com. And you can either comment on the videos or you can even email me through those things as well. So uh, that being said, let me pray us out and pray that God would encourage us uh, both in the fact that he is coming, that the Lord is coming for us to snatch us away. And one day he will right all the wrongs. He will set a new, uh, he'll establish his kingdom and, and establish this uh, righteousness on the earth so that all will see what God has intended the world to look like. And then ultimately one day we'll step into uh, eternity as the Bible describes it after that millennial kingdom and all of these things come to pass. Honestly, I wish I could go on for an hour because this really excites me, but my hope is that will excite you too. And so, and, and that talking about it like this encourages you to dive in even further. So that being said, let me go ahead and Shut up and let me pray and we'll finish this. So Father, we thank you so much for uh, giving us words of encouragement like this throughout the scripture. That Father, a topic like prophecy, while on the one hand, seemingly kind of intimidating in some ways because we don't know every facet that's gonna, you know, that how things play out necessarily. We thank you that you've given us a lot in a general sense that can help us understand, at least in some sense, what's going to come down the pipe and happen. And so, Father, we pray that like those first century believers in Thessalonica, that we would encourage one another with these things, that we wouldn't divide over them, that we wouldn't fight, that we wouldn't get uh, sort of, uh, you know, argumentative with each other about it, but that we also wouldn't avoid healthy discussion and debate, but that, Father, we would allow these things to, to be sort of a form of iron sharpening iron, that we would become much more uh, knowledgeable about our faith in its fullness and in, in, in that which we're coming to expect. We thank you for the glorious hope of Jesus coming that we hold as believers. And we just want to look forward to that and live each day in the knowledge that we are going to see him soon. And maybe even sooner than we think. And so, Father, we praise you and bless you for this. And we just ask you to encourage us with these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>